Hello, welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens, this time from the great indoors. And um, once again, I'm interviewing Ant Insuli, who's um, appearing on this side in audio form with the VU meter going up and down. Uh, so yes, uh, Ant, welcome back to, um, to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Niall. It's good to be back. Uh, it's good to be back with your uh, audience and uh, to yeah. talk about this uh, weird and very strange world that we're <laughs> currently mm. currently living in so mm. thank you for having me back no it's cool i think uh, i think weird's a bit of an understatement these days i think <laughs> but um yeah it certainly is so um yeah i mean i have uh, at the moment i kind of feel like uh, i'm a bit snowed under there's so much shit going on in the world i can't keep up with it and as you said before we went on air you've been going and doing some normal work in the analog world so um you know yeah i i really don't know uh, what to focus on exactly but i thought i'd start um with the um that that man i can't remember his name now but he was the uh, the man who was dressing in the traditional garb of the religion of peace who was a green party candidate for one of the constituencies in leeds and when he won right. instead of saying hooray for recycling and hooray for saving the planet <laughs> He said, uh, Alawa Akbar, which I believe is not Arabic for hooray for saving the planet. And um, yeah, so how the hell did Britain get to a situation where the Greens are now like that? It amazes me that that is even possible to happen. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, I've heard, I've heard certain people say that um, hmm. uh, the Green movement is just a, a cover for, um, pedo for pedophiles, but now it may, it may turn out... <laughs> Yeah, the green me movement is actually a cover for radical Islam. So that's uh, maybe they'll combine the two. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of segue. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know, but it is a little bit worrying to come out and be quite so unashamedly yeah. open about your intentions. Yeah, well, I, I actually have a theory that came to me the other day, right? And this is that you know when you um, end up with uh, when you end up here yeah, with a place with no middle class. You end up with a place with just the very rich and the very poor. And mm. um, Britain was kind of like that, with a smaller middle class, I suppose, than it has now. Before, well, during the time of the empire, there was a lot of poverty. There was also a lot of aristocracy. And there was only a moderate middle class. And um, I kind of think that what happens is that the, uh, the posh uh, rule everything. Um, they usually have got their fingers on the ball a bit more. There's a few stupid entitled hooray Henry's about but generally speaking, they're aware of class divisions. They're aware of where they are. They're already mm. where they need to be, and there's no issue there. They're not trying to pretend to be something higher than what they are because they already are it. And then the other end of the spectrum, you have a uh, working class or poor people who usually are very much in touch with reality, tell you it as it is, take you as they find you, or not at all. Um, and um, when you end up with... Uh, a middle class especially like um the type of middle class that we've ended up with now they're not haves they're not have nots they're all haven't paid for what they have this is what i like to call them uh <laughs> right and the line of credit has been you know extended and extended and extended so a lot of people who would have been in the working classes have been brought up and then intergenerally intergenerationally have been brought up into the lower middle classes and then they've become uh very much like wet liberals and so as a result, uh, back in the time of the 1970s, where there was much more of a difference, you know, you had the, you had your very posh people and you had your very working class people back then compared mm. to now. Now you've just got kind of a blur of pseudo midwit, sort of like quasi posh sounding, but not very bright, not very erudite and not very wealthy people in large numbers who um, can't... Um, have any can't afford to have any luxury items that the uh, the, the, the lower classes don't have anymore because they've all got that now so now they have to have these luxury beliefs and a lot has been spoken about and that ultimately when people become uh, middle class and when the middle class expands to too big what happens is that they become the traitor class and they're the ones who usually sell out the country because they feel too guilty to have what they have compared to what all those poor people in all those other parts of the world, while they still resent the posh and they still resent the common because they're vulgar and they still res resent the posh probably sour grapes because they're not quite posh enough themselves. <laughs> and um, so they hide behind humanitarianism 
and they become a hotbed for socialism to metastasize. And so, as a result, the Greens, who are like that, are uh, they 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 can tolerate people shouting out Allahu Akbar while winning elections, but they can't speak about it because they fear that they will be uh, considered racist if they do. Um, so, as a result, um, they're too soft to rein in this because they're too scared people will call them racists. Uh, but and at the same time, everyone who's saying, "Hang on a minute, this is a problem. This is not what we. This is not the deal." Remember 9/11. Mm. Remember all of those things that happened in the past. You know. Remember we got a lot mm. to be scared of. Uh, if they open their mouth, they're automatically told that they're that they're just to, to the you know as much to the right as Adolf Hitler. And so <clears throat> I kind of think that as a result of being sold out by this wet, uh, this very wet champagne socialist middle class. Uh, this is kind of like what, what they usually refer to as late stage capitalism. This is what I think late, the, the real meaning of late stage capitalism is. Too many people too guilty, feel too guilty for what they have in relation to us poor people who don't. They become socialists, they become wet, they become superficially virtuous. And then unwittingly, unbeknownst to themselves, they end up being stupid enough to sell out the country to the enemy. And I think this probably is something that's happened many times in history before. Mm. Well, I don't know what you reckon yeah. that, but it just came to mind. The yeah, yeah. I, I, first of all, it, as you were speaking, I just had that image in my mind yeah. about uh, the famous Monty Python sketch, of course, about class. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Insert here. Um, I just think that um, for, for eons, hasn't it, socialism been the ideology uh, of the privileged? Um, it, is, yeah. it is a privileged um, kind of mm. ideology in terms of the growing um, middle class that you're talking about I mean of course that all started back in the day in the 80s under mm. factorism and the right to buy um, yeah. council homes I'm not saying that's necessarily a good or a bad thing I think um, perhaps what Covid demonstrated was that the ease with which um, the kind of the new middle class if you will or new money perhaps yeah. um, the ease with which they can be manipulated um because they don't have any real rootedness in their new class expression and perhaps um from my point of view what sort of uh, really identifies this new middle class is this um this need to keep up with all the latest technology so it's it's convenience at any at any price really yeah. i think that's uh, that's something else so that's how they get sort of bled financially. So it's, well, I need the latest, you know, iPhone. I need to have the the latest um, electric car or battery car, as I prefer to, co to, prefer to call it, <laughs> yeah. sorry. But, yeah, I think it is interesting what you're talking about in terms of the expanding middle class and, and, and the class system in general and, and how it has changed. But I do think, um, as you're pointing to now, there has been a deliberate attempt to kind of expand... Um, the middle class in in many ways, and there definitely isn't a uh, kind of useful uh, uh, idiot element in terms of those that who do support left wing um, kind of uh, mm. ideals. And I mean, going way back to the eighties, a lot of um, left wingers have always been part of the uh, aristocracy, um, you know. And uh, think of the likes of uh, you know Hillary Benn and and all these people who are uh, keen to extol you know the virtues of a working class lifestyle they they came from very middle class um very middle class backgrounds kind yeah. of things well so, actually it was yeah. tony ben he was uh he was a lord wasn't he, he was an aristocrat of here yeah. Um, yeah yeah anthony wedgwood yeah. ben and he uh, decided to um hand it all in but uh but yeah no i, I was actually thinking that the, the way the cycle seems to work is that the, the middle classes end up committing their own cultural suicide because they end up being useful idiots for the kind of change that then brings feudalism in afterwards when all the money's taken away from them. And then you end up... Back all the credit, as you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, they become, mm. like, you know, instrumental in bankrupting the economy that made the middle class in the first place. And, um, you know, so you've got, like, uh, what I would think of as the people who are maybe patriotic or, I mean... I. You know, I mean, people who, like, at the top, you've got the establishment, uh, a certain brand of the upper classes in the UK, like um, maybe the royals and other people like that, who keep the traditional pageantry going. 
you know and mm. uh, at the bottom you've got the people who have their george crosses the blokes who are called gammons these days and they seem very <laughs> rooted in the legacy of our culture but the middle class is um at least in england what has happened to them is that they've become ashamed of the, the empire that happened in the past and um, yeah, uh, yeah. and so now yeah you kind of uh, what's it round sort of islington dinner tables now is that everyone's got to be ashamed of everything that happened in the past um, and everyone's got to appear to be virtuous to all of those um you know people um that are from poorer backgrounds or whatever but the the trouble is then <clears throat> that they they end up uh the, the, it has the seeds of its own destruction it becomes a cyclic thing because they create a, a situation where you know um it it basically fucks up the economy fucks up the whole political thing it cre increases the size of the state which increases the tax burden on everyone um and as they've opened up the doors you know because they've opened up the doors to god knows how many people coming into the uk now houses have been built at mm. a, a, a much uh, was it slower rate than um you know than the people that are coming in and um well you know if you were to if you look at property speculators they'd be uh, thinking oh the price is going up so everyone gets priced out of being able to live anywhere so as a result no one owns a house anymore um but there's not enough houses to house everyone and this all comes down to like i say i think it does a lot of the time come down to middle class guilt because um they think oh these poor people from those poor countries they can come here and uh, but they don't realize that they're actually importing uh, a lot of enemies as well and they've made it uh, they framed it so it's racist to even have that thought in your head um, while at the same time in the working classes uh, there are plenty of uh, people not just from a white background but I mean well, I grew up in uh, council estates and I know that one of the most assimilated people to working class England was those of Jamaican stock and a lot of them would have yeah. the same problem that white people do about the present state of, of immigration at the moment so it's not a race yeah. issue and a lot of us know that but the people who do know that haven't got a voice and uh, if they try to say something um, they're usually on the receiving end of very many straw men that are set up against them mm. you know and, yeah uh, yeah so that's what i see i, I think i think yeah you, you point to um uh, important thing again in terms of <coughs> excuse me sorry they always um the system whatever you like to call it uh, the media, let's just say the mainstream media will always mm. keep discussion within the bounds of uh, race and ethnicity because then you never really get to the real heart of uh, the the nub of the issue, of course. No. And you'll never uh, you'll never hear, say, like uh, you were talking about um, someone of uh, Jamaican heritage or Afro-Caribbean, perhaps mm. is a better way of saying it, saying, yeah. well, uh, you know, I, as a, with that heritage, I'm concerned about immigration. You'll never see people like that. Mm. Um um, speak on the mainstream media just in the same way once a year um, in the UK we have this thing I don't know if it's for a week we have this campaign and it's called the Black Pound <laughs> and it encourages black people to only shop or um, you know buy services and goods from uh, black owned businesses online and of course there's probably um, a sizable percentage of um, black people yeah. who who rightly think well that's racist that's uh, promoting apartheid but you wouldn't he hear their voices you know no. I mean which something like that obviously is mm. um, so the, the the conversation and the discussion in the mainstream is always skewed towards um, a certain uh, perspective where the likes of us um, and much of your audience, no doubt, would be labelled as gammons, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right, right wing racist gammons. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's it's true, and it's just it's ridiculous. I mean, I don't know. I, I like to say these days that I've been in the tropics for so long that uh, my gammon appearance has given away to a, a slightly more tan appearance, which now means that <laughs> it's now impossible for me to be racist against Meghan Markle. I say that, so uh, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, no, the uh, that's one of the things that that does uh bother me i think also like in ireland because i don't know if you've been keeping up what's going on in ireland but they're they're absolutely fuming now they don't they want they, they you know most of the irish people now are rioting and basically don't want the immigrants there anymore and uh, the difference with ireland is that the whole country is a population less than greater london and yeah. um the and, and the, basically the irish could be outnumbered in their own country in no time at all and then the irish will only exist as and uh, like me as an export-only um, race of people, you know. 
and um, and they've turned they've basically uh, turned on their own politicians and have been writing and you know are sort of like uh, but the difference between the Irish and the English is that the you, it's very easy to convince the English that they're they they caused all the world's problems because the empire or the Australians and Americans because they're living on stolen land or whatever. But you can't convince yeah. um, anyone, the Irish, that they have any reason to feel guilty because they're kind of like the black and the brown people of the world, and uh, in that they have been on the receiving end of this oppression themselves. And Ireland, as a result, um, can get away with being an ethno state, you see, without um, anyone being able to project fascism or right wing onto them, because the whole point of it was that they uh, they were trying first to they had to get free of uh, England. And then they had to yeah. um, get rid of. They had to become free of the influence of Rome, and now they're in a situation where they have to become. Yeah, they have to get free of the influence of the globalists and the European Union. So, the Irish are smart enough to realise that the people who've been ported to their country are not necessarily the you know the the primary problem. They know that uh, that there's another empire there that's doing it to them, and um, you know in this uh, attempt to turn Ireland into Sweden, I think Ireland will go the other way, and if they are able to overthrow the regime that they have and Con and McGregor could become president and they end up with a whole new political system they could become like Hungary I hope to see yeah. that anyway so you know yeah so. I think um, with regards to Ireland I mean I, I my my window to the Irish perspective is through Thomas Sheridan yeah probably again like quite a few of the people that comment on your um, videos I see that they also comment on Thomas's, so there's probably some sort of overlap there. Mm. But I mean, obviously, you, you like you're alluding to, how can you guilt trip uh, the Irish for a non-existent colonial past? Mm. They've been the victims of empire, mm. um, British Empire, of course, in various forms. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what's going on, putting these um, housing illegals or immigrants or however you want to describe them deliberately near small irish towns is obviously a provocative act yeah um what why are they trying to provoke provoke the irish are they trying to take advantage of this sort of stereotypical sort of ancestral perspective that the irish are um you know uh, are good natured and friendly people which i believe that they are mm. um what uh, is um are we you know the the new world order or the crazies in control are they are they going back into a deliberately you know wanting to provoke us uh, perhaps mm. you know we had a bit of a lala after covid didn't we yeah uh, maybe maybe that is the maybe that is the issue i mean i've um as you know um when you came mm. and visited me uh, you know um sort of this part of the new forest or yeah. i kind of live in an area called the waterside which is actually you've got a strange dichotomy you've got quite wealthy people you know lord farquhar in Bewley, <laughs> and then you have the quite um you have you know kind of like quite working class people hmm. sort of overspill from southampton yeah. um but even in this area god can i share this one i said this last time i'm going to share it anyway <laughs> oh. i think i did share it last time forgive me but uh, even in this area now, I'm noticing more and more diversity, shall I say, in a, in, a, in adverted commas. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, there, I, I do take heart from a lot of the comments section from, say, if um, something comes up on my telly on YouTube about, mm. and it might be, you know, just a, a, a normal newspaper uh, that's put out uh, a video out there and, and the comment section more and more people are aware of this issue of immigration and they are aware of uh, the impact that it it's that it's having uh, on uh, the indigenous um, population so I am so I get to my point the point I'm going to make now is if they do ramp it up again even here in the UK in old blighty I think we are getting to the point where it isn't just going to be right-wing gammons that are getting, you know, slightly angry. It will be, you know, more of the so-called uh, normal, normie population, as you like to call them, yeah. um, who are going to get a little bit angry and, you know, may want, to, you know, hmm. there to be a stop, to be a halt. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Watch this space. Yeah. 
Well, actually, I was um, I was recently watching a video. There's this uh, man on YouTube called Paul Thorpe. I don't know if you come across him. I have seen him, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen him, he started off uh, pretty much, he's uh, a work, work, working class geezer who speaks a bit like that, like old sad London right. bloke, right? <laughs> um, and he, uh, you know, and he, uh, oh, I don't know, I miss that accent, man. I, I, this is another thing, man. The Cockney accent has been kind of killed off where I come from, man. It makes me sad, you know? It's like I uh, lost that. It's like London's lost its soul. La, to people who are yeah. speaking that this now blood in it thing, and uh, so you got the white, the white brethren like, trying to be like the black man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but you could get, you could, you could actually have a Jamaican uh, black cab driver, right, who speaks like an old Cockney geezer, <laughs> and he say, "I can't stand all these Afghans in this country these yeah. days." <laughs> right, that's how <laughs> really weird it's got. But but now, uh, so what happens is. Paul Thorpe went to um, a place near Gatwick Airport, which used to be a luxury hotel that the American tourists used to stay at, which is now used to uh, house migrants. And he went in there and he met a couple of uh, blokes that were talking. There was this um, nice chap from South Sudan, a black man who was of Christian origin. And he said that he was um, coming away from South Sudan because the the oppression and the racism that black uh, Christians get from uh, the Muslims in South Sudan. And this bloke seemed all right, actually. So then, um, he, and Paul thought was nice. He interviewed him. He was kind enough. But when he was about to leave, a couple of security guards came up to him. One of them had a mask over his, hiding his face and no ID, telling him to get off the property. And um, he, I don't know where the hell he was from. He could have been like from some like East African country or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. um, that was the worrying thing. You have anonymous security guards with no ID who don't show their face. And every time he asked questions, they just said, no comment, no comment, no comment. And then you have to get off the property, leave. And they were right in his face. And as he was leaving, he was filming them following him off the premises. And um, there was something deeply sinister about that. You know, no one knows what goes on in there. And um, a lot of people believe that there's a possibility that, that they're being trained for something. I mean, no one knows for sure, and that's the thing, you know, so we can't confirm or, or deny anything. But, I mean, you know, I, I kind of feel like a, I kind of feel like I dodged a bullet by getting away from all that stuff, <laughs> the way things are looking at the moment. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, when I compare it to here, the Philippines, um, you know, uh, I, was, I was explaining to Angela how, if, if you know, she, she said she wasn't happy about Afghans coming here, and she was happy when the government here, the uh, present Marcos administration, said no. And I was explaining to her the other day, if they tried this out here, the first thing they do is they get the Afghans to move in to the 4% Muslim areas. They'd play off your native Filipino Muslims against your native Filipino Catholics. They'd expand the middle class to the way. They'd indoctrinate them over a few years, turn them all into a bunch of blue-haired wokies, get them to side with the Muslims. And then before you know it, they'd get people from the uh, militant group, the New People's Army here. And they'd somehow uh, managed to insinuate some of their ideas into academia. And before you know, that's what would happen um, to the Philippines. But there looks at this point like there's no chance of any of this stuff happening here. And not only that, but the economy is, has grown twice as much in relation since 2008 compared to the British economy. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you, that freaks me. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a clearly third world country that is definitely emerging. There's signs that things are getting better here all the time, rather than Britain, which has a much better built infrastructure, but it's crumbling. Well, it did. It, yeah, and you know what I mean? So it's like, it, I'm, I'm looking and thinking, yeah, there's trade-offs for everywhere you go, but, but now I'm just thinking, there's absolutely nothing to tempt me back to Europe. Not even my favourite places yeah. in Europe, like Portugal. There's nothing to tempt me back to Europe at all anymore. I, I just sort of feel like... Uh, I wouldn't want to. I just, I just feel like, uh, you know, I mean, I'd rather go to North Korea, to be honest, the way some <laughs> days, you know. <laughs> so, but, but I've written off half the world now as, play, as no-go places. Or, or shall I say, mm. stopover places if I'm flying in and out of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I like a lot of your audience because obviously I like to regularly keep up your videos. Mm -hmm. uh, we're probably looking upon you... Um, in your beautiful new um, home, looking at looking looking um, feeling looking feeling yeah. rather jealous more and more now because if I can mm. just I don't know if I can just bring in another element of the conversation or to the conversation is yeah. 
and this is something that many people speak about online uh it's not spoken about in polite conversation in here in britain perhaps but um just to move things on a little bit in terms of you know perhaps the the post covid effect the whole ptsd is it's just that um and I'm, I'm saying this not because I want to say that I'm more elevated than other people or that I have a higher energy, but more and more what I notice is this aspect of what people talk about broken Britain is mm. not just in terms of infrastructure. And I've got many stories, anecdotal stories I won't bore you and your audience with about examples of this. Yeah. But it's just this, when you just look into the faces of people, uh, and it's quite sad how switched off people are, how agitated they seem, how stressed they seem. And this is for many, many reasons, of course, mm. not just the post-COVID effect, but that is one. And, you know, the cost of living crisis, um, increasing debt, uh, the increasing nastiness of the state and their draconian um, kind of rules and all things like that. And that's one of the reasons, I should say, why I would be open more and more to live in a different location, if I can just put it that, is because just how how switched off people are it's like for me if i go into a supermarket okay i'm not like oh hello everyone but you know i am at least open to eye contact and you know talking to people not in a you know crass idiotic way you know going up to everyone and disturbing mm. their peace but at least being open and i know to some degree when you go west in the uk and you go to parts of wales and scotland people are more open to that but i think in london and the southeast uh, where I am yeah the people are just so closed off and it is quite depressing when you go out you know what I mean just to see and it is sad to see what duress the the kind of duress that people uh, are under as well and I say that not because I'm you know I'm more evolved spiritually because I'm mm. certainly not but it is sad to witness and it does day to day it does take its toll to see how you know um in in a sense, yeah, people are oppressed in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think uh, that I mean I've got noticed that that people are very downtrodden and miserable looking um, in yeah. the southeast. I mean, when well, I was in West Drayton when I lived there, um, there's a lot of that there. In fact, I had a foreign girlfriend who come home. And she kept saying, "Oh, everyone looks miserable in this town." <laughs> All right, uh, but she did notice that people look less miserable in Brighton, say for instance. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like. Um, yeah, one but of that might be a deluded bubble. That might be a woke Brighton delusion. Of, uh, I think this <laughs> so. was before the age of woke, but you know, you know. What I mean? Oh right, okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. But uh, no, I think what it what it is is that like yeah, um, I kind of feel that in in the UK that it's been this way. I think for a while, and I think it goes back to way before this present era, even before the two thousand eight crash, the cost of living crisis. But I think it goes way way back. The, the UK is um, uh, very much an in-group, out-group society. You know, it's it's very rigidly class-bound. Um, if you're a member of the working classes, you've got to sound like you're common as muck. Um, <laughs> you, you've got to you, you've got to speak inarticulately with small syllables because how dare you know any big words? Because uh, you know, if you if you know a few big words and you're just trying to be specific and go. Who, who, who swallowed a fucking dictionary? Who was Mr. Clever here? You know, that's the attitude you get if you're trying to communicate in the working class England. But then in middle class yeah. England, you have to deal with the fact that if you don't conform to the latest set of luxury beliefs, then the whole town mysteriously suddenly starts not talking to you and they treat you like you're not there. You know, yeah, you have to know your place at the bottom of the clique, at the bottom of the social hierarchy, and you have to earn your stripes to, to get up to the top of that. It's almost like as if uh, an automatic system of pseudo aristocracy is working as they're trying to intimidate. Uh, uh, what's the word? Imitate the posh. And I've found that Britain um, or England in particular has always been like this. And um, you know, you you could be in. You could be in a, uh, a gentrified gastro pub, but across the road you can see a, a rowdy slaughterhouse boozer, and um, <laughs> and you can stand there in front of a couple of middle class people and go point this way and then point that way and say I really hate how this country is divided by class, and they'll they'll wa wag their fingers at you and go oh oh no you shouldn't generalise. But they were the first people to make the most sweeping generalisations about people who didn't vote to remain in the European Union themselves. 
the hypocrisy and inconsistency, blindness to one's own self, bollocks. And um, yeah, I kind of feel that like England has always been like that. And you know, I have to say, me, me, you know, Irishmen and my Irish ancestors uh, start getting angry about that if I start thinking about that too much. But I've kind of always felt that like maybe it's not so much in the north or Wales or Scotland, but definitely in in the south and particularly the southeast of England. It's like, you know, there's a kind of um, know your place peasant, uh, uh, sort of like an iron fist or steel toe cap boot on the, on the psyche of everyone in society, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right that there's definitely an insider and outsider group. Didn't mm. we see that during COVID? Oh, yeah. Or before you left, you, you witnessed it and probably felt it yourself. I think yeah. that's why um, the whole um, scamdemic... Mm. Um, it's probably um, along with certain states in the US and along with um, a lot of Australia, so the kind of Britain's colonial past, that yeah. the the most extreme measures were in those places, perhaps because of the whole uh, the whole aspect of the insider um, yeah. outsider group. Yeah, which was spoken about was it uh, Richard Desmott? Can't remember his theory. I did speak about it on my podcast once, but yeah, that whole concept of the um, the insider and outsider group to, to see it in operation in Britain mm. um, was 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 I, I kind of mocked it because um, uh, you probably remember I've spoken about this before perhaps so forgive me if I'm repeating myself but mm. at the height of COVID at the beginning in March and April we we had the one-way systems in the supermarkets oh, or deliberately yeah. walk back and on one occasion I got chased by one of the managers you know <laughs> kind of, um, comedy-esque and and you had um, most people were shouting at me for just walking in the opposite direction to the one way arrows because I thought, no, screw it. I'm going to parody this. Mm -hmm. Initially, I got angry and thought, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. Then I thought, well, I'm going to cope with it by parodying it. But mm -hmm. anyway, so the point I'm making is that's just an example of, you know, how crass the insider and outsider group gets when you don't uh, follow a one way arrow. You're ridiculed. I mean, yeah. how did that stop the spread of a virus? Exactly. Uh, like viruses um, don't, <laughs> don't have one way streets, do they? And um, <laughs> oh, I still remember that one time when I was in Kingsbridge in Tesco and uh, I walked the wrong way down the one way arrows. I felt very deeply satisfied by doing that. Uh, oh, it was great, wasn't it? It's yeah. very satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, the the um, what was it? The other thing that, like, you know, that you could uh, you could uh, you could uh, take your mask off if you sat down. You could uh, go to a pub and take your mask off to drink, but you were only had to drink if you were eating a Scotch egg. And then when they relax, uh, and then when they said, "Oh, you can have wedding receptions now, but you're not allowed to dance in them still," right? And I thought, right, so this this virus must be very, uh, you know. But also the mask thing was the one thing that bothered me because, I mean, you know, you could, if you try to explain to the normies that uh, if you take everything down to a, a microscopic level that, um, you know, you couldn't use a Wimbledon tennis net as a condom, <laughs> right, for the same reason you couldn't use the mask to get rid of, to stop the viruses coming in, they would have looked at you like you were the loony for pointing that out. You could even go all Baconian on them with your instruments and demonstrate in a microscope the size of mask holes and viruses. And they still would would think you were the loony if you showed them the evidence of it. Yeah. And I think um, I saw videos of people come um, coming up to, right in people's faces and shouting at them, even with the masks on. You're killing my really granny! disturbing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't get too much of that. I remember once I was walking out of one stop locally mm. um, and some some woman some old woman said put your mask on mm -hmm. uh, that, that I didn't I didn't get too much because I don't I don't go looking for it yeah. you know what I mean but just on the if I could just add on the yeah so the masking so going into pubs you had to wear it going to your table but mm. then you could take it off to wear the food but then going to the toilet you'd have to put the mask back on mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then returning to the table you could take you could take the mask back off so just yeah. uh, just also to add with the mask initially i was i was quite militant so um i would walk into shops and not wear it but i think initially also they could refuse you entry mm -hmm. so then they had the lanyard thing but then i i felt like a sellout because i started using the little the little um the little green lanyard thing <laughs> because they had to pander to the woke minorities you mm. know 
um, the dribbling brigade, um, yeah. they had to have the, the lanyard. So I felt like a bit of a sellout. But eventually it just got uh, easier just to wear yeah. the lanyard because then you couldn't get hassled by the security men, you know. Yeah, well, I was at the time because, I mean, the first year I was cautious because I thought, well, maybe this is real. Um, yeah. But then uh, by the time the second year of it came along, I was being cautious and, uh, well, although I feel like an idiot for it now, but, I mean, I was... Uh, sanitizing my shopping and I was wearing a mask to go to my local Morrison's uh, but my reasons for here had changed I was doing it specifically yeah. so that I uh, could increase the chances of getting a negative test so that I could get the fuck out of England and stay the fuck out of England <laughs> and then as soon as I got to Costa Rica I just sort of fuck the rules right. uh, I'm free and uh, so I was um, doing a, uh, what you call it being a staunch conformist with ulterior motives <laughs> during that last year of yeah. being in England, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't conform for any other reason except to undermine the system that I'm conforming to. Of course, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I I I still think um, I still think you're incredibly brave. I know you did what you had to do in terms of your medical choice, medical yeah. procedure choice. Um, but that, for me, like at the time, I, I think, yeah, you're incredibly brave to do that. I feel uh, it's incredibly I, I stupid do. to take that vaccine now. I, I really do. I mean, I didn't really need to in the end. And Oh, did you not need to? to no. Travel? I mean, not to get oh, to Costa right. Rica. But there was a possibility right. that I may have needed it to go to other countries and uh, even to go to borders. And also, I think I might have needed it to come back to the Philippines. But in the end, I didn't because everyone had dropped these right. rules and... And I, I realised that I didn't need to take it at all. Uh, I mean, I've been right. okay. I don't, I don't think uh, there's any red flags in my health since. I, I think it's a difficult one to do because you know that the, these, these, these vaccines have definitely been responsible for causing a lot of problems. That even to this day, that the, the, the say the, the gatekeepers of the of the main narrative don't want people to talk about. But then there's the mm. other option, the other problem, which is you can't get any true data or true statistics on how many people are not affected by these vaccines, because the the truth is just want to tell you it's everyone, and then uh, the the propagandists want to tell you no, hundred percent safe and effective. So you can't. Yeah, there's no middle. Yeah, there's no middle. There's no middle ground, is no. there? I think even recently, um, so we've had the announcement that the AstraZeneca jab mm. that was or the version yeah. 1.0 has been pulled and all the rest of it apparently they're working on they're working on new versions so the big yeah. pharma business models we know, it, you know <laughs> it's it's very profitable i always um i always went from the premise of um i suspect that what was actually delivered in most people's arms mm. or administered uh probably wasn't um wasn't the mrna because that would have been extremely i assume costly mm. to synthesize and not easy and how would have they done that within a matter of weeks and then to distribute it to literally billions of people around the world yeah so um i remember at the time i i went with the the belief that probably a third had you know literally a placebo nothing or sugar solution hmm. and then maybe one third had the real the real the real deal the real juju yeah. and then another third probably just had an off-the-shelf annual um flu vaccine so the amount yeah. of people that you know, that's what i went with but you know it's so hard because yeah to actually if you wanted to study the hmm. actual real effects it would be difficult because you don't know what people have been injected with yeah, so. but there's probably a secret database because I mean every individual yeah, who was yeah. vaccinated would have been yeah, known, yeah. A, se uh, uh, a cabal of secret people would know what was in each batch, and so they'd yeah. be able to do their data. And as there were no medical trials by international law, as we were the medical trials, it basically means is that some of us have to be placebo in a double blind test. And only yeah. a certain number of people could get the QR code or reference code to every individual. So they'd be able yeah. to work out who died of what um, while doing the studies yeah. in secret. Uh, and this stuff is not released. So I kind of think I survived Russian roulette twice so far. But, yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's the, honestly the, the way I feel. But, um, yeah, I mean, in the case of all this, the fact is that not no one, you know, there's not many people who are talking about 
this, not not remembering. Do you remember, never forget those times? Like everyone's become ashamed of those times and it's just been sort of brushed under the carpet. I mean, I, I've been doing videos ever since. I must admit I was taken in to some degree and my videos can be held as evidence against me for anyone um, who wants to was it dig up any archaeology of me <laughs> having a different opinion from the one that I have now. Um, but I don't care because I'll just admit, yeah, I didn't know any better at the time. <laughs> What's the well, so, it, yeah. If people were being kind, they might say you were being prudent. Yeah. You know, you know. But uh, I mean, you know, at the time, I did honestly think that this could be a plague and I didn't know any different. But then um, uh, this was a, a sort of like, for me, this was uh, a learning curve because then we realized that no actually creating a plague that kills everyone is actually not that easy because uh, the more contagious a virus is the more it has to keep us alive otherwise it dies out yeah it still has its own darwin thing going on and it doesn't want to kill all the hosts so you know viruses that do um, kill pretty much everyone guarantees to kill everyone that they get into contact with like aids and stuff like that well they're very difficult to spread yeah, so, they have a natural shelf life, as you're saying, of course. Yeah, yeah. they they will. Yeah, mm. they will. They they have a natural sort of, yeah, they die out eventually, pardon the pun kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, just lastly, from my perspective, um, in terms of um, in terms of the jab, what always kind of got my go or yanked my chain made me particularly annoyed when we were being tagged, um, mm. well, myself, with the whole, you know, uh, anti-vaxxer, uh, Covid denial oh, was yeah. well, you know. Even um, virology, uh, you know, trust the science would mm. have to admit that you need a control group. So therefore, yeah. how can you have a go at people for not taking it when you need a natural control group? Sorry, it doesn't doesn't. So even by mm. their logic, you know, it made no sense that they were having a go at people that you know were making their own choices about their medical <laughs> procedures. Yeah. So we say that just shows you how crazy it all was and how things continue to be similarly crazy yeah well it's it's true like um you know also the the well i mean it had gone to Id idiocracy levels i think that the whole yeah science and logic and all that had gone out the window it was all about propaganda at that point and you know that when yeah. they're using the word denier in any context whatsoever they basically mean uh to call you like a holocaust you're as bad as a holocaust denier exactly well it's climate they're invoking denier. that exactly yeah. yeah climate denier science denier covid denier <laughs> vaccine denier the word denier always means holocaust denier which always means you're far right um and yeah. that's uh, basically uh, the thing uh because you're dealing with idiots i mean um i had a bit of an experience the other day where there was uh, some uh welsh bloke who was talking about the fall of the uk and I commented on uh, his, you know, about the English and the Irish. I, I made a left a comment. And I had some uh, academic smart ask, give it large with all his citations while talking, telling me that I was blinkered and I need to travel more and all of that. So, of course, <laughs> I gave as good as I got. And I told everyone, don't, don't, rest uh, there, was a, there was about 12 comments and some people were taking my side and he was slagging off all these other people. So I just basically spelled out to everyone the, the um, uh, what you call it, the intellectually dishonest academic playbook that he was using against them and to not, in, not encourage him. He's using intellectual dishonest, the, you know, was it fallacies, sophistry and ad hominem attacks uh, but while trying to um, frame the debate and make it about something irrelevant to the point that was originally made. Uh, do not encourage people like this. Uh, I haven't heard back from him since, but, uh, but you know, I've... Uh, I decided that one of the things I would do is learn how to outwit intellectual smart asses uh, because a lot of these people are not very bright but they're just very adept at uh, using this kind of what you call it entry university debating society smart ass thing in a very yeah. stupid way that actually breaks the rules of the academia that they're studying and there's a whole wall of these people out there you know um, when they say personal attacks like call you blinkered and say tell you that you're stupid and 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 everything's a slur, um, you know the the thing is there's not enough people out there that, that are armed with enough knowledge to go back to them and say hang on a minute, none of those points are actually an argument, and apart from the citations that you're referring to, I don't see any argument coming from you as an individual. You're just giving out ad hominems, uh, but the the thing is that 
a lot of people are intimidated by this whole line of uh, what I call it, this whole line of um, pseudo intellectual gatekeeping, and mm. uh, this works very well with uh, with uh, you know propaganda. And um, I honestly think that this is one of the reasons to get more and more people into university was to lower the IQ of university graduates, um, but fill their heads with intellectual sophistry and um, pseudo intellectual bullshit and get them to uh, talk like that because it's very intimidating to people who haven't taken it upon themselves to study and decode logical fallacies and how they're used against everyone. I always say that like, it wouldn't work in a football match because every fan knows the offside rule. But if the offside rule was like a Freemason secret and no one knew about it, then they could make it up as they go along. And that's exactly the sort of game that intellectuals play on non-intellectuals or academics play on, oops, on non-academics. And I think that that was a big factor with the whole COVID thing as well, with the gatekeepers on the mainstream telly and all of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a really good point you make. I think, yeah. um, well, we all know it, I think, part of what Tony Blair was brought in to do with the new Labour revolution alongside crazy levels of immigration, that's where it began, was the whole mm. university project. But, yeah, yeah. Um, with the university thing, I think, obviously, you've got things like critical theory, um, oh, God, yeah. rel relativism, postmodernism. So these kids come out and they literally can't think because mm. if truth is relative, then, you know, that, that rotten pigeon... Um, in you know the Tate Modern has as much um, you know has as much relevancy shall we yeah. say or as much creative value as a Van Gogh I mean that's yeah. the insanity of and, and that's that level of thinking has undoubtedly le led to the the general just dumbing down of um, British and uh, uh, Western society. I mean, if you've got whole generations of people, again, I'm not saying all youngsters coming out of uni can't think, but the way in which they think has definitely changed. Um, yeah. I've had my own experience of that. I know, quite frightening. I actually thought of a great idea. I thought of this years ago, but I'm surprised no one has done it yet. I'd like to do it, but I don't want to get arrested. Uh, but I was yeah. thinking that someone should go to Tate Modern and find one of these awful pieces of art that, you know, these ugly abominations that they that they laughingly call art and i thought what would be a really good idea would be to eat lots of food eat lots of neat food colorings uh followed by eating something that will make you projectile vomit and then vomit <laughs> over some art right that'd be a good idea <laughs> uh, with lots and lots of different colored food colorings in there but but be uh, when you do it be accompanied with a camera crew a journalist and an old school art critic who can justify why what you've just done is art. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, that, and then film it. I think that'd be brilliant. I think that would work. Yeah. I mean, talking of talking of projectile vomiting. Sorry if I come across as a heretic because I know there are a lot of alternative types that really like Banksy. Yeah. I have my own theory about him. So his mm. latest installation looks like. Um, uh, vomit looks like projectile vomit or uh, green vomit on the wall somewhere in London I think and what was hilarious mm. was this is an example of how strong social engineering is mm. um, you had these middle class types that mm. you know travel down from wherever and they were cooing over this vomit puke on this wall <laughs> right uh, they they were like oh like it was you know a religious effigy, effigy somewhere you know like it was yeah. lords for the, mm -hmm. the catholics um yeah. in france and they were and it was like literally green puke on a wall hmm. and um my theory just quickly i put my conspira conspiracy hat on for a moment in terms of social engineering and what i think with the likes of banksy who um Basically, the middle class, you know, they love him. He's their poster boy. Okay, yeah. they absolutely friggin' love Banksy Banksy. Mm. I know someone or a friend of a friend who went to one of his recent exhibitions or something in London. And just a brochure, uh, I don't know, I think it was £10 or something, um, was selling for hundreds online. <laughs> so, yeah, he is like this. He's got this status of, you know, like a religious icon. People worship Banksy like yeah. a religious deity like mother mary for the catholics oh yeah <laughs> and my theory my theory about in terms of the social engineering is if people believe that someone like banksy is high art or is the pinnacle of creativity then it caps off 
this sort of spiritual evolution as a human being because if that is the high water mark then it's like well that's an incredibly uh, from my perspective now i can appreciate it, what what it is that what he does i mean if he is a person mm. he probably isn't a person but the fact that they keep it all shrouded in mystique um mm. you know i think that's all part of the thing so i think it's it's all part of the dumbing down process that's my point yeah, well, I mean, the thing that bothers me about uh, Banksy is that, like, um, if you go back to the 1990s, there was this time when you had Britpop and you had uh, drum and bass and you had clubs, yeah. raves, all of that. And in yeah. that context, uh, the art like Banksy would come across like real counterculture. But yeah. in this modern political flippening that we've had, um, especially in the 2010s, those people have become the establishment class, but they still they, have. they yeah, think yeah. they're counterculture. They still think they're the revolutionary yeah. class, yeah. But the real counterculture yeah. now are the Englanders who live out in the countryside. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I look like the way I do now, and I have a kind of a look of old school counterculture, long hair and just got a slight, slight hippie look. But uh, I sort of don't consider my appearance to be countercultural anymore. You know, if I wanted to be countercultural now, I'd just have short hair and a suit. You know, but uh, yeah. it just doesn't. But then again, I'm not. I'm not the sort of person who'd want to just change my appearance uh, to be uh, contrary to other people. But um, the but the, this is the weird thing about it is that the um, the people who live away from the cities now have become the counterculture. The people who want to, um, if you like, maybe even go back to a more 1950s conservative world, have uh, become the new counterculture. But the um, the establishment class who've uh, become like hit by this bourgeois bohemian thing, the post nineties drum and bass Brit pop thing that you would have in the UK or whatever, they still actually believe that they are revolutionaries and counterculture. They they just don't seem yeah. to understand that they're not anymore. They are the new establishment, and um, yeah. it's it's like uh, it would it would be a one thing if they knew that they were the new establishment, but I don't even think they do know that they're the new establishment. Which is yeah, very they're, strange. They're count sorry, Fringe. They're they're counterculture because they read the Guardian editorial oh, and uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's, I, I to be fair, I can see how people get stuck because in the nineties yeah. I was very political. Yeah. Um I was very lefty. I got Tribune magazine, which was an old style Labour left leaning kind of paper, and I buy New Statesman, and I was thinking, oh, look at me, uh, I'm quite intellectual, and I would buy the Guardian and the Independent, um, mm. and you know, thinking I was intelligent. So, but I've kind of uh, I've changed since then. You know, I've grown, yeah. and uh, at my perspective and how I see the world has changed. So I, I do understand that kind of sort of uh that that sort of preening that sort of not that i've ever been middle class back then but i think there is um this idea of yeah this the the intelligentsia and mm. it's still very much you know alive and well <laughs> yeah I, I mean I, I call this new i've got my own word i call them the stupidity seer now you know yeah uh it's a bit of a mouthful but it, it seems to explain <laughs> them better than uh, than anything else you know so yeah yeah and I did encounter um, about five, six years ago when I lived in Bristol for year, a year. There, there is full of them. It's full of um, full of these types. And mm. of course, you still at the time you had um, you had uh, Corbyn as the leader of the Labour Party, so they were all Corbyn Easters. And it's like I remember thinking, oh, so we're just redoing the eighties, are we? Oh, for mm. God, do you know what I mean? Job not <laughs> dull. And it's like, hold on, you know, someone similar age to yourself born in the early 70s mm. thought we've done this yeah. so to redo the 80s left right paradigm divide mm. that isn't a revolution is it <laughs> well it's a revolution in the sense that you just go around back to the the same groove that you started with but there's no evolution yeah. in it at all <laughs> so, exactly yeah and uh i don't know i just uh feel that like somehow um we got lost uh you know i mean the last i suppose the last cultural big bang if you like that changed our society entirely onto something new was from the era of rock and roll onwards in the 1950s you know um yeah and again it was just that the right it was like the right um inventions happened at the right time so you, you know you had the definitely yeah. movies and color uh, movies and technicolor cars, yeah. then you had cars then you had the the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder which allowed for the first time multi-track recording and editing of music which then led to uh rock and roll uh 
and um, the uh, how to say the development of that technology plus electronics, which led to um, you know how could I say more electronic and synthesizer sounds coming into music. And so it was a period of 30, 40 years of sounds and production styles that had never been done before, never been heard before. And it was a time of yeah. full, total novelty. And, uh, and all of this was completed before the internet even came along. And all the internet mm. has done now is just regurgitate everything at a lower quality while the technology's been getting smarter than the people. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I'm finding myself in this time now where I've got the... I've got a recording studio on my bloody laptop now, which uh, <laughs> Abbey Road in the 1960s would have been dead jealous of. But, but it's almost like, what's the point of even bothering to make any music? No one's going to hear it. And um, if, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do anything groundbreaking now. And there isn't much interest in, in, in that anymore because, uh, you know, you, you hear the unmusic, as I like to call it, that you hear everywhere. It's like people's palettes are, are not there like they used to be. So we've gone through a renaissance period and now we're in the, um, the exhaustion phase and we're living off the legacy of a previous renaissance period while the world appears to be going a little bit apocalyptic. And um, we've got this sort of like people who are living off the legacy of a, of a genuine counterculture that they're living out in the present day as a pseudo counterculture while mm. failing to realize they've become the establishment. Uh, it's like, yeah, we, it's like the, the culture that we live in now is a museum or a, or a kind of a, a <laughs> derelict building or something, you know. I, 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 would, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you make a good point in terms of, we are, I think part of this um, sort of um, crisis um, mm. that's been spoken about quite a lot in the alternative media is, is the end of novelty, how we've mm. reached, we've reached... Um, We've almost reached the end of materialism, if I can put it that way. Hence, mm. why the powers that were want us to take us down the AI route. Yeah. But it, I mean, for me personally, I've often thought about if I could have the discipline to to write. And then I think, well, why would you want to write? And because if you start a blog, well, you know, a bit like my podcast, no one listens to it. What's the point? Whereas, <laughs> you know, if you think back when blogging was all de rigueur popular back yeah. in the day, twenty years ago now, really, before yeah. videos took off. Hmm. Um, it, it was quite easy to build an audience if you had something decent to say, but now it, not so much. And I know the weird thing was initially the internet was great in terms of creativity because it was a new outlet or platform for hmm. people to share their work. But now I think it's an inhibitor in in many ways because unless you already have a, a sizable audience or a decent sized audience, which I don't have um, hmm. for whatever reason, maybe I'm just sharing a load of rubbish, could be, I mean, hold my hand up. It's very hard. Hmm. Uh, and maybe I should just get back to having the discipline of just writing for the sake of writing. But because we live in the internet age, whenever we think of creating something, we always think in terms of how well is it going to be received? Yeah. Um, you know, which ironically enough stifles creativity. So I think we are reaching a bit of a dead end really which you know people who are spiritually focused would mean that's why we need to go within which i'm open to but culturally that's why we're at this sort of full stop this sort of we've reached a morass an end point in many ways haven't we? yeah i think we have and um also i mean you know i think i think this is one of the reasons why i'm glad um, i'm not in the west because uh you know uh i'm, I'm in this mysterious culture that i'm floating above if you like, and I'm only really semi-connected to it via the wife. Uh, but I feel, I kind of feel okay because it's a, it's a much, it's like I can be an outsider here uh, and I can have an equilibrium. People are not, um, people are not hostile to me, treating me like an outsider. Um, people are actually kinder to me than they would be if I was in England. Um, you're a curiosity, you're a yeah. blue-eyed Irish man. Yeah, here I am, I'm a, I am a curiosity and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just great. Uh, it's, it's bloody great having blue eyes here as well. I mean, bloody hell, I feel like, uh, I feel like, um, what to say, I need a shitty stick to beat the women off with once they start yeah, looking into my eyes. I'd say it'd be good eyes. if you were single. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, so 
But I mean, I I kind of, and also you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the other expats, a lot of the blokes that you get out here that you see English, American, or European, are usually fat, old, bald, and you know that don't look like they've looked after themselves. So I'm kind of one of the better looking ones. <laughs> and they're also twenty years older, probably. <laughs> yeah, they they are. They're all twenty years older than me, and uh, you know, there's that. Uh, so you know, it's kind of, but in a way, it's okay because I um you know, uh, I mean normally I you know I. I don't like it when people are too much like God botherers and I, you know I have my reservations about the Catholic religion but I can see how sort of like um, how it keeps the society together here I can see how it acts as a glue yeah. to keep everyone together yeah it's important and, yeah and um, you know I'm, I'm quite happy with that there's something like they're still in a very much more traditional old paradigm you know they're much more socially conservative than anyone in Europe is um, and you, although you might see the odd uh, cool person or hot chick or whatever, um, and you might <laughs> An see influencer. <laughs> yeah, you might see the odd tattoo here and there. But generally speaking, you know, eight nine out of ten of everyone that you see here just looks like a traditional person. Um, you know, it's not like you walk down the road and every you know, like you in a city, you don't walk down the road and every second or third person you see is a trans or a blue haired person or has got a septum piercing or anything like that no it's it's not like that at all uh you know and um you know again when it comes to uh westerners expats and the old traveler you see a lot of them in the tourist area but when you go into the main towns or cities again we only make up barely what m at most five percent of everyone you see um most people that you see everywhere you go are filipino and um I like it that way. I, I hope it stays that way, you know, because I mean, you know, you've seen these recent pictures of certain parts of London where you don't see any indigenous people anymore and Bradford and Birmingham and uh, Leeds and, uh, you know, pretty much uh, parts of Bristol. Croydon. And, cro oh, yeah. <laughs> Dog Dallas on the cheap. <laughs> eh? uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, so in a way, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of people who come here, but uh, but it hasn't upset the balance it hasn't upset the cultural equilibrium and um mm. i like it and i hope it i hope it lasts and i hope it stays that way um because yeah. uh, at least for long enough should we say uh yeah. you know because um I, th I think that like at some point in the future i honestly see that once the west is done and dusted um you know th i think asia maybe bits of South America, maybe um, certain islands here and there. Uh, it's going to be, uh, we're going to get to a point in the future where uh, we're going to have emerging economies uh, outside yeah. the West. And, you know, there's all this talk about um, uh, they want to stop us flying and have us living in 15-minute cities. Well, it hasn't worked, has it? No, but even then, <laughs> Dubai um, and Manila and other Asian cities are expanding their airport capacity. So yeah. while the, you know, I'm going online and everyone in the West is telling me we're doomed, we're not, we're all going to live in pods. <laughs> um, I'm now just thinking, oh, that's only the West. That don't matter. That's, that's my attitude now. <laughs> oh, it's only the West. It's only a small bit of the world. <laughs> and, you know. So yeah, I, I just yeah. yeah, yeah. If I can just quickly glag uh, uh, ags, I know we're coming up on about the hour now. Is, yeah. Um, the reason why in the future when my personal circumstances change a wee bit mm. and why I might just join you away from Blighty, away from the West is um, what what we've lost here in the UK is that sense of respectability. So uh, sorry if I sound like an old traditional conservative, forgive mm. me. But, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, people dressed a certain way still in a respectable way. Now, yeah. Increasingly, people just look like they've thrown something on. The women, they wear, they all wear these leggings. They look like plucked chickens, <laughs> tattoos everywhere. Forgive me if I sound like a snob, I probably am. But mm. just the way people's deportment, the way they carry themselves, the way they speak, yes, yeah. tattoos and all the rest of it, the way they shout in their phones. Yeah, um, that's right. There, it's just, no, you know, it's like I, I would quite like to live somewhere where there's respectability. And people know, you know, to just be a little bit circumspect around others. And, and you know, mm. that's how I feel anyway. God, I sound old, don't I? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly think that there's been a real change. I mean, I was thinking back to, oh, back in the day. You no, know, even when I used to go to those goth clubs, right, in the 80s, when I was a teenager, it was like um, there was this look that was something like halfway between sort of a, a vampire Victorian look and punk. 
And um, but a lot of these people took pride in their appearance. They actually looked good. They didn't look like yeah. it was badly done. You know, yeah, yeah. You, you get these badly done weekend goths, and they they're the ones who look like people from the twenty first century. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, 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 I'm sure you. I'm sure you won't be alone. I'm sure there'll be. Um, I'm sure there'll be um, many people following you trying to trying to escape because it is becoming it is becoming more and more uh, intolerable for reasons that I said about earlier as well. Just how shut down people are, just how miserable they are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. it's, it's true. And, and you know, and I, what I was saying to you earlier about I've been recently watching uh, old episodes of Minder um, just for nostalgic reasons. And um, it reminds me of a London I grew up in because I was like a kid becoming a teenager during the time. I think when Minder was around for about, well, the ones with Dennis Waterman before he left. It, it covers an area of time between when I was seven and 17 years old. So right. um, when I watched those episodes, I remember that London. And um, I remember people speaking like that, looking like that and everything. You know, and um, and all the old rhyming slang and everything, and I, I kind of miss that because it mm. was uh, it's like it's it's gone. You know, imagine that everyone in Liverpool, a mate of everyone in Liverpool, still sounds like a scouse, eh? <laughs> they but, do, yeah. But you know, you go to London now, you you have to go to Essex or Sussex or Kent or you know <clears throat> Surrey or any of these places. Yeah, yeah, that's where you find all the people with Cockney accents now. You don't find them in London anymore. Because London has pretty much now been they've in. all moved out. Yeah, its base working yeah, class he, culture has been evacuated. Yeah, and um, you know that's sad. Yeah, mm. it is. It is sad. It's like a country that's been that's been hollowed hollowed out from within, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like I say to people, you know, like you know, I kind of consider myself to be a Londoner of a London that no longer exists anymore. Um, and now I, I've well, I told you what I call London now. I call it. Uh, I call it Dubai on Thames for the rich and Mogadishu on Thames for the poor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Mogadishu on Thames. Yeah. Yeah. God. Um, bits of it in uh, Gaza on Thames now, aren't they? So you know, that's that's what I see. It's like, uh, you know, now back in the day, of course, a lot a lot of these Guardian readers would say that's racist, but. No, the London I grew up in was multicultural. It had um, Jamaicans, it had Indians and Pakistanis. It had, it, had, um, it had my lot, the Paddies as well. So, you know, and I was part of, I suppose, multicultural London for being of Irish descent. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, what you call a right-wing, Nazi, racist, bigoted gammon issue at all. No. It's a... Uh, but yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but have you seen that video by Dominic Frisby, the we're all racist now or we're all far right now? I haven't, no. Oh, no you, you I'll check that out. You must look it up. It's the funniest thing I've seen in ages. He, he sings the chorus to the tune of uh, Knees Up Mother Brown. And um, <laughs> the first verse is about how everyone's um, uh, racist and the second one's about how everyone's far right. And the third um, one is about um, how everyone's got mental disorders. And the chorus <laughs> is uh, adapted from Knees Up Mother Brown. And it's, right. it's fucking hilarious. So I don't want to spoil any more of it. But yeah, Dominic Frisby, I think either we're all racist now or we're all far right now. But okay. that'll have right. you pissing I, I yourself will... laughing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 will, I will check that out. Yeah, I will yeah. check that out. And yeah. while, while we're on YouTube, I suggest you, the viewer, also find that as well. You know, if you want to, right. if you want, if you want your to have de on your death certificate name, blah blah blah, called the death <laughs> Dominic Frisbee's comedy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. I'll uh, yeah. We should uh, wrap this up till next time then, Ant. Yeah. Know, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Niall, for inviting me on to your uh, podcast it was a very interesting uh, conversation uh, yeah. as always thank you very much thank yeah, you cool man till uh, next time so uh, yeah till next time yeah, yeah cool if you like this content don't forget to like subscribe and share and while you're at it check out all our social media links please help this channel grow your help will be appreciated